This is the main symbol of Saudi Arabia's future, a 170 kilometer long city project that will be built from scratch in the middle of the desert without cars, powered entirely by renewable energy and costing half a trillion dollars. And this is another famous symbol of the kingdom, Al Safar Square with the Palace of Justice. Public executions are still carried out here where the criminals have their hands and heads cut off. Why does Saudi Arabia still have customs and laws that many would consider belonging to the Middle Ages? Why does the country at the same time open up to the world and try to present itself as the most progressive and attractive on the planet? And most importantly, how does Saudi Arabia spend its huge oil money and what does it get out of it? Look at what Saudi Arabia looks like from space, not a hint of vegetation. In this part here, there is nothing but sand and here it looks like rocks and stones. 95% of the country is desert or semi-desert, and mind you, there are no permanent rivers in Saudi Arabia at all, and therefore, there is a big problem with fresh water. And it is water that has led the Saudis to oil, and as history has shown, to a lot of money. But let's start from the very beginning, 1930s. The kingdom of Saudi Arabia was still in its infancy, and it was one of the poorest countries in the world, because the whole economy here was basically three things. Agriculture, you know how big it is in the desert and with no water. Second thing, trade with the neighbors. There's a little gold, silver, copper mining. And the third one, pilgrims. Saudi Arabia is home to the two most important shrines of the Islamic world. They are the cities of Mecca and Medina, and every Muslim must take the Hajj once in his life to come to Mecca. And therefore, five days a year, there is a mass influx of believers in the kingdom. In fact, these were all the income streams they had at that time. The king of Saudi Arabia understood that he had to develop the country somehow and support what he already has, agriculture. But let me remind you, he does not have enough water. This is what the king's advisor, former British diplomat and intelligence officer Jack Philby is looking for. He also invites a couple of American guys to Saudi Arabia. They drive 1,500 miles to the deserts drilling here and there, but find no water. Instead, they announce to the Saudi king, we're sorry, we didn't find it. But experience tells us we're looking for the wrong thing, your majesty. The land in the eastern part of Arabia is sure to have oil. And yes, indeed, a little later, the largest oil field in the world would be discovered there. But then in the early 30s, there were other favorites in the Middle East. First oil was found in Iran and the British got their hands on it because they had the money, the technology, and the power. The same would happen in Iraq in 1927. But the Saudi oil would go to the Americans. Why? There were three reasons. One, Saudi Arabia didn't have any extraction technology since they had to ask the Americans to look for water. The second reason was the banal greed of the British. As you have understood, they had enough oil to deal with in Iran and Iraq. In addition, the Saudi king immediately demanded a considerable amount of money, 100,000 pounds in gold for the undiscovered oil, by the way, which you may never find. The British were only ready to give 10,000 for such a venture. The Americans, on the other hand, were willing to give more, 35 at once and in gold. In a year and a half, another 20, and if they found oil, another 100,000 on top. And the third reason is political. Look at the map of the British Empire. It already controlled Palestine, Iraq, Egypt, the Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Oman, to give them a potential Saudi stockpile meant in fact to give the British the whole region. And as a result, in March 1938, the Americans started pumping oil from the first Saudi well. A year later, the satisfied king personally turned the valve and Arabia's black gold began to flow around the planet. And now look at what happened at the end of 1973. There was a crisis in Western countries. There was no gas at the gas stations. The money devalued three or four times faster than usual. Unemployment was growing and the economy stopped developing. What was going on? The price of a barrel of oil soars from $3 to $12. Consequently, the price of gasoline instantly rose, followed by everything else, transportation, production. In short, oil was then the lifeblood of the world economy. What does this have to do with Saudi Arabia? Just a second, let me explain. On October 6, a coalition of Arab countries attacked Israel, and it was successfully defending itself, largely because it was backed by who? Correct, the US. Tanks, planes, ammunition, all this was supplied to Israel by the Americans. But at the same time, the states themselves were by now dependent on Arab oil. Saudi oil was 20% of everything the Americans bought abroad, and they were the biggest and most powerful in OPEC. For those who don't know, OPEC is an organization of oil exporting countries. At the time, they held half the world's production and 80% of all proven oil reserves on Earth. It's mostly Arab countries in the Middle East, and they could care less for the Jewish state, as well as all those who supported it. And since they couldn't do anything to the Americans by force, they simply prohibited the US, Canada, Japan, and some European countries from buying their oil, which made the price of gas fly far away from reality. And then you also have to understand what the whole American auto industry looked like at the time. They were huge cars, which gobbled up fuel like crazy. Here you go, the best-selling model in the States in 1973. Oldsmobile Cutlass, the minimum engine on this beast with 3.2 liters. 
but there were even more pumped up models with four and even 7.5 liter engines. That is, such a beast would burn about 20 liters of gas in 100 kilometers. And now imagine what happened when fuel prices doubled at once. In essence, the Arabs would strike with a triple blow on the American economy, on its main symbol, the automobile industry, and as a consequence, on the whole American way of life. Let's look at the facts. In 1973, the states produced 8.5 million cars and only 10% of them were small cars. Four years later, almost half of them would be small cars. Now look at what happened next. In the middle of the next 1974, the US Treasury Secretary went to Saudi Arabia. Officially, this was some sort of economic diplomacy tour of Europe and the Middle East. But the real purpose of the trip was kept a closely guarded secret. Simon had to do the impossible. First, neutralize the Saudi's oil weapon, which was killing the state's economy. Second, make the Arabs themselves voluntarily invest in the American economy. How was that possible? The plan was ingenious. America guaranteed to steadily buy oil from the Saudis, and what the Arabs earned, they would guarantee to lend the interest back to the states. That is, the money would still go back into the American economy. But the Saudi king had a condition. No one should know about it. Why? Well, the king was afraid that the Saudi money would be used by the Americans to support Israel, and the people of the entire Middle East wouldn't see that as cool. The states agrees, and for 40 years they would hide Saudi Arabia in their own reports of holders of the U.S. government debt in a group of 14 countries as just oil exporters. The scheme was only discovered at the end of 2015, when there was a new oil crisis and the Saudis urgently needed money to save their budget and they wanted to sell loads of U.S. bonds. But the thing is, Saudi Arabia poured at least $117 billion into the U.S. economy over those 40 years and actually became one of the state's top investors. What can we compare that to? Let's take U.S. military aid to Israel. Over 75 years, they spent $150 billion on military support to the Jewish state. You have to agree, a very curious cycle of money in the nature of the Middle East. But about the same time that the Saudi economy was going to hell and when it became known about the Arabs' colossal investment in the States, in April 2016, the Saudis launched their most important program, Vision 2030. According to it, the kingdom should stop being dependent on oil and become almost the most developed country in the world. How? Look, the Saudis have such a fund, PIF, Public Investment Fund. Its task is to invest in the most promising companies, technologies, anywhere, as long as it grows in the future and brings profit. Today, the fund already has about $600 billion in assets. They've bought stakes in Facebook, Boeing, BP, Tesla, Uber, Electronic Arts, and Nintendo, and even English soccer club Newcastle was bought using the same wallet. The main goal by 2030 is for the fund to become the largest in the world and control 3% of the world's property worth $2.5 trillion. Just so you understand Saudi ambitions, Norway and China have the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world right now, and they have $2.6 trillion worth of assets. For comparison, the Russian sovereign wealth fund in March 2023 is only $150 billion. Here is a logical question. Where does the money come from? Look at the list of the most expensive companies in the world. Among the almost exclusively American crowd, oil company Saudi Aramco, the Saudi national treasure, is in the top 10. Yes, today, it is valued cheaper than Apple or Microsoft, but the important question is how much money Aramco makes. Look, in 2022, Apple made a net profit of $116 billion on all its gadgets and services, and how much did the Saudi oil company make? A record $161 billion, and who owns it? 98.5% belongs the very same fund. In other words, the Saudis made so much free money over the past year that they could buy, for example, Gazprom. But of course, this is just for comparison. They need this PIF for something else. For example, last year it was this fund that paid for the move of the world's top Instagram star, soccer player Cristiano Ronaldo, to Saudi Arabia. The Portuguese will now play for the Hitherto unknown team Al Nasser for 2.5 years and will receive about half a billion euros for this. Such inadequate money has never been paid to a player anywhere else. Why do they pay him? Let's see, Ronaldo has 564 million followers on Instagram, more than any inhabitant of the earth. Once Chris became an all Nasser player, the team's account soared from 864,000 followers to today's 14 million, and the Saudi Arabian Championship is now watched every week by soccer fans around the world. Many of them, I'm afraid, didn't even know such a country existed before Ronaldo arrived there. Still, why would they pay so much money to get him there? Remember what the Saudi strategy is called? Vision 2030. In that very year, 2030 is the year of the World Cup anniversary. It is the most popular and the most prestigious sporting competition on the planet. The last final in Qatar was watched by 1.5 billion people. 
What does this have to do with Saudi Arabia? They are expected to apply to host the tournament as early as this year, and its main ambassador and face will be the most recognizable face in the world, Cristiano Ronaldo. Now check out this news item from March 23rd. Saudi Arabia orders 39 Boeing 787 Dreamliner at once and poaches the head of Etihad to launch its own new first-class airline. They are planning that by the same year, 2030, Saudi planes will fly to 100 cities around the world. And if you've seen the videos about Turkey and Dubai, you know what Emirates and Turkish Airlines were invented there at their time. To daily promote a welcoming and caring image of the country across the globe. Because today, that image is not very good, to put it mildly. All power in the country is in the hands of one family. Actually, the country is called Saudi Arabia because that family's surname is Al Saud. For a long time, music and cinemas were banned there. Women had very few rights. They couldn't drive cars, work in sales, go abroad, or undergo medical treatment without the husband's consent. But today, all these restrictions are being lifted. Why? To stop being dependent on oil. Look at what the country's sources of income are. More than half of it is oil. Take it away and the economy collapses. And now compare it to the picture of earnings of more advanced neighbors, the Arab Emirates. There's plenty of oil here too, but the dependence is clearly less. Russia is even more diverse, and if you take some Netherlands, they are neighbors with Saudi Arabia in terms of GDP, by the way. Then you can't stop staring at it. The scientific name for this is a diversified economy. It's like a table with a billion legs. If you take out one leg, the table will still be standing. And if the table has only a few legs or just one leg, there is no need to push it. It will lose its balance and fall. And Saudi Arabia has made the first step to comprehensive development back in 2005. Then the ruling family allowed local students to go abroad to study. 10 years later, in 2016, 200,000 local students were already being educated abroad, primarily in the USA, Canada, Great Britain, New Zealand, and Australia. Most of them returned home to live and work, and naturally, they, who had seen the Western way of life with a variety of freedoms, had a demand for entertainment at home, like concerts of foreign music or popular movies and cinemas. And mind you, almost the entire population of Saudi Arabia today is under 30 years old. That means you have to develop new technologies and create jobs for them. You can't get them all working in the oil industry. And yes, the main progressive face of the kingdom today is Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He is only 38 years old, a boy compared to other world leaders. And that's why the country has such projects like Niam. What is it? Look at this desolate land on the shores of the Red Sea. Here, in an area almost the size of an entire country, like Armenia or Belgium, they are going to create the territory of the future. And the craziest project, the Lion City for 9 million people, is 170 kilometers long, only 200 meters wide, and 500 meters high. Taller than the Empire State Building, and all this futurism is going to live without cars, only on renewable energy. How will this even work? In theory, it's simple. The city of the future consists of three levels. The first is pedestrian to live on. As I said before, there will be no cars, but only parks, bicycle paths, recreation areas, and other cool stuff. The second level below is the service level. Stores, offices, restaurants will be built there. The third is the lowest. It is the transport spine of the city. Here the goods will be delivered. Here also the usual subway and a single line of super high speed transport will be laid. To get from one end of the city of 170 kilometers to the other in just 20 minutes. This is to answer the question of why a Saudi fund is investing in Elon Musk developments to make them appear later in Saudi Arabia. But that's not all. Here at the crossroads of the most important trade route from Europe to Asia, they are building the port of Oxygon. The ski resort Trojina, a tourist cluster for luxury beach holidays, Sendala. And according to the idea of the project, 40% of the population will be able to get to these places in less than six hours. That's where else the new Saudi airline will come in handy. But now from plans to reality, the Saudis have already built an international airport. Remember where the rapid growth of Dubai began? There too, an international air service was opened in a desert nobody had any interest in. There are also already several luxury hotels on the coast, and attention, a huge complex with palaces, villas, golf clubs, and other pleasures for the royal family. Why all this? It's far from certain that Neon will be built in the end, or it will be built, but not the way the beautiful computer graphics is painting it now. But there is one thing that project is changing right now, the way the country is being looked at by the rest of the world. Whereas before Saudi Arabia was considered to be the world's gas station with tough rulers who did whatever they wanted, chopping heads, restricting women's rights, and not letting anyone in. Now with such projects and ambitions, Saudi Arabia is the center of attraction for global innovation and investment. It is obvious when the starting cost of such a project is estimated at $500 billion. 
It's like wasting the entire Russian budget on construction alone, but they did it once, no? Even with the huge oil revenues, you can't cope on your own. You have to attract foreign money, and that's why the Saudis are now blasting with all the PR guns about how righteous, liberal, and eco-friendly they are now, and it works great for Western audiences. But the Saudis have a different concept for their neighbors to the east. Look at the Strait of Tyran next to the very Niam. On the other side, it is the most expensive and popular Egyptian resort, Sharm El Sheikh. And these islands here were given over by Egypt to Saudi Arabia after a long debate in 2017, because it is through them that the Saudis promised to build a bridge that would connect Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, bypassing Israel, so unloved by the Arabs. And there is more curious news from the other end of the region. It goes something like this. Saudi Arabia has made peace with Iran, thanks to China. Let me explain. The Saudis have really been in constant conflict with Tehran for the last 40 years, because since the Islamic Revolution of 1979, Iran's main slogan is death to America. Saudi Arabia, on the contrary, has been investing and flirting with America all this time. And now that the state's influence in the Middle East is waning, the Saudis seem to have decided to play the role of the new regional leader, as the richest and most progressive, and now also peace-loving. That is, in essence, Saudi Arabia's objectives for the coming decades are to attract as much Western technology and money as possible, to take advantage of its geographical position and become a key bridge between Africa and Asia, and to completely change its image and turn from an oil kingdom with medieval customs to a country of the future.